it's becoming increasingly challenging for companies, <laughs> increasingly challenging for companies to compete, innovate, and stay ahead of the pack. So if we want to be able to do that effectively, we need to start by examining our own practices, <coughs> by challenging ourselves and challenging each other. We have to start by putting it on the table and calling it as it is. Yet in some cases, we find ourselves shying away from conversations that are no doubt difficult, but necessary in order to ensure we're doing not just the right thing, but the best thing. You see, by shying away from those conversations, we're missing out on an amazing opportunity to put our brains together and harness the power of collaborative intelligence, which is critical to success. Now, I'm not saying that this is easy, but a personal experience led me to think that maybe we can learn a lot on that front from all the physicians we work with on a daily basis. You see, five years ago, our family doctor asked my brothers and I to pass by his practice with our father. When we got there, he looked at my dad and told him that his lab results are in and showed that he has acute leukemia. What followed was a very painful, very emotional conversation that informed dad that he has less than a year left to live. It also allowed him to decide how he wants to go through his last journey in life. Needless to say, this conversation affected us all so deeply. In fact, it affected me so much that I couldn't help but eventually ask this doctor, how can you have such seemingly impossible conversations with your patients? And the answer came back almost immediately. He said, I've been a practicing physician for more than 15 years, and in my practice, I have to have such conversations a minimum of five times a month. Yet believe me when I tell you that till that day, I'm sick to my stomach each and every time I have to do it. Till that day, it's the hardest thing I have to do in my life. Yet I do it without a split second of hesitation because I've taken an oath. I've taken an oath to always act in the best interest of my patients, no matter how hard this might be for me or for them. So I do it because it's my duty. It is my responsibility. When we sign up to be part of the Johnson & Johnson family, we in turn are making a promise to always act in the best interest of this organization. Now we're lucky. Our promise comes with a guidebook. It comes with our handbook. It points us in the right direction in our quest to do right by this organization points us towards our, our patients, our North Star. So how come despite this promise, despite the highest sense of duty and responsibility, which I'm sure we all have because otherwise, let's face it, none of us would still be here today without it. How come in many cases, we're still shying away from conversations that are difficult, granted, but they are not life and death. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that there must be something more than just duty and responsibility. In fact, when you look at it, at the core of this doctor-patient relationship is an intrinsic element that makes those conversations possible. And that element is actually trust. You see, the patient trusts that the doctor's telling him the truth. The patient trusts that whatever the doctor's telling him is not driven by a hidden personal agenda that the doctor has. The patient trusts that whatever the doctor is telling him, is telling, he's telling him that for his own good. In fact, the patient trusts the doctor so much that even after he's received the worst news in his life, he actually looks back up to that same person who delivered it to him and asks him for his opinion. What should I do now? What are my treatment options? How do I move forward? You see, trust is the cornerstone of every difficult conversation you need to have in your life. Be it with your family, your friends, your husband, your wife, especially with your wife. Trust me. <laughs> and without trust, every attempt you have on having such conversations will fall apart and end in disaster. 
So if you expect people to live up to their duty and responsibility of speaking their truest minds, sharing their deepest concerns and putting it on the table, then it's up to you as leaders to live up to your duty and your responsibility to create an environment of trust where people feel safe enough to do exactly that. Now, the thing with trust is that it's something you have to build. I mean, you can't just send out an email telling people to trust you and magically trust appears. I wish it was that easy. <clears throat> you have to display several traits that allow you to build trust. Credibility, reliability, selflessness, or as little as self-interest as possible. But a specific trust builder I'd like to zoom in on today is your ability to ask <coughs> is how open basically you are to others. And by that I mean, how well do you ask others for their opinion? Especially asking the opinion of those who have a different perspective. And once you do that, now here's the trick. How well do you listen to them? And not just listening in order to make a list of yes but in your mind so that, so that you can better rebut it and dismiss the other. But how well do you listen with the genuine intent to understand and learn from the other. You see, it's only when you do that, that you start to think with those who think differently. And that is the first pillar of collaborative intelligence. The second pillar of collaborative intelligence is your ability to get past your bias, to challenge your own worldviews. It starts with your ability to accept other people's input on your ideas, allowing them to build on what you shared with them, to iterate on it, and contribute to shaping it. Getting past your bias also means sometimes changing your stance altogether, conceding on a position you've been advocating for simply because you realize that what the others suggesting might work just better this time. We have to get past rigidity in our point of view if you want to ensure our company con continues to succeed. <laughs> After all, we're surrounded by examples of great companies that failed because they were too rigid in their stance. Kodak <coughs> went from being a market leader in printed photography to, to filing for bankruptcy simply because they were not able to get past their bias for printed photography. <coughs> Maybe the best way to uh, illustrate how rigid this company is, or was, is by uh, highlighting the fact that the first digital camera ever created was created by one of their own, by a Kodak engineer back in 1975. Yet when this engineer took his uh, prototype to the board, what, the, what his board told him, and I quote word for word, oh, that's cute, just don't show it to anyone. So by dismissing him, they missed out on the greatest opportunity they had to become market leaders. By failing to question their own practices, they basically made themselves irrelevant. By failing to overcome their bias, they did set some that themselves up for failure. At the opposite end of the spectrum, you have IBM. A company that understood that the only way it could bounce back from a staggering $8 billion loss it incurred in a single year was to get past its bias to its main frame of business and reinvent itself into a software and service company. Needless to say, this transformation wasn't easy. It involved a lot of difficult conversations. But perhaps what's noteworthy is the fact that the man behind this successful transformation behind this successful turnaround was the only CEO in the history of IBM who was hired from outside the IBM ranks. Actually, he was hired from outside the computer industry altogether. So him being an outsider allowed him to be unbiased to the, to the set ways, to the set practices that were in this organization and allowed him to objectively assess the different directions he could take this organization in and then win and then choose the winning strategy. Now, you don't have to be outsiders to do that. You have to be able to pass by, uh, to overcome your bias, to be objective. You don't have to be outsiders to understand that in order to build collaborative intelligence, 
sometimes you will choose to concede on a position. And that same concession is gonna be a win for you because it's a win for your organization and it's a win for you in value and equity as leaders. Going forward, to build competitive advantage for this organization, you're gonna to have to have those difficult conversations. You're gonna to have to have uh, challenging debates and you're gonna to have to put it on the table. Failure to do so will keep you from harnessing the power of collaborative intelligence. So it's up to you as leaders to create an environment where collaborative intelligence can flourish by establishing trust, by being open to others, and by being unbiased. And it all starts with you putting it on the table. Thank you.